so much, Seas. Uh, we've had such a great time here. It's been really a huge treat. I've been wanting to come to the um, garden for a long time. So thank you to all of you that have taken your time from your busy schedules to meet with us and show us around and um, you know tell us all about what you're doing at this great place. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Morton Arboretum, we are located in the outskirts of Chicago in the western suburbs. We, uh, the Arboretum was founded in 1922. It is a pretty big area, 700 hectares or 1,700 acres, uh, with 900 acres of natural areas. We have like 100 staff. And we have many different programs similar than you have here, like education and events and festivals. But we also have a science and conservation department, which in our case is divided into three divisions. The Center for Tree Science that um, has seven scientists that focus on different areas of tree research. We have the Chicago Region Tree Initiative, which focuses more on um, improving the canopy of the Chicago land area, tree planting, um, also equity, because a lot of the areas in Chicago that have low canopy, excuse me, <coughs> that have um, low canopy cover um, are in the more uh, underserved communities. And then the program that I work with, which is the Global Tree Conservation Program. So I'm going to be focusing today just on the Global Tree Conservation Program, but I'm happy to tell you more about the other divisions afterwards. So why Global Tree Conservation? And I know probably I am like talking about preaching to the choir here, but um, the recent State of the World's Trees report revealed that one in every, uh, one third of all the tree species of the world is threatened with extinction. That is more than 17,000 tree species. And just to put that into perspective, that is more than double the total number of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals that are threatened combined. Yet, you know, tree research and tree conservation and plant conservation in general have been totally underrepresented and underfunded compared to more charismatic taxa. So here, what is also to me even more worrisome is that for a lot of them, there is not even enough information to emit a very basic IUCN red list assessment. We don't even know the most basic things about where these species are, their occurrences, their biology. So we don't even know if their populations are declining. So some of the areas with the largest uh, threats are also the most biodiversity rich areas of the world. So it stands out, for example, in the Malayan region, but by far the neotropics are the most, uh, have the highest number of threatened species. And you can see here, like 7,000 of threatened and with a total of 23 plus thousand uh, tree species. So that brings us into perspective, like that the neotropics are a huge area that should be explored and also where conservation work needs to take place. Some of the most um, clear threats that emerged from the report were uh, land use change due to agriculture, urbanization, um, timber industry, also pests and diseases, and climate change. But of course, these threats are very different in different places, in different contexts and for different species. So it is important to consider the global landscape of conservation, but also the site-specific threats when you are trying to preserve a species. And botanic gardens can play a huge role in trying to prevent biodiversity loss. We are at a very privileged position at the intersection of academia and the public, and a lot of people connect with botanic gardens and see them as their resource and their trusted partner for plants and for trees. And so, as I'm sure you're all doing here, uh, botanic gardens can really do and are doing a lot to preserve um, the global plants and trees. We have science and horticulture, we know how to grow the plants. We also have the public, like I was saying, and we know how to preserve collections in ex situ and also can help bring these plants and conserve them in situ um, for, for preserving them in the long term. However, 
the biodiversity paradox is that if you look at this map, you can see that the botanic gardens um, that are located in hotspots of the world, which are in red, are way less than the gardens that are in green, which are located in other non-biodiversity hotspots. So there is, a, there is a disparity between where the biodiversity is, which means really where it's being lost the most, and where the majority of the botanic gardens are. Therefore, we need to make an effort to do things, strengthen the existing botanic gardens in those areas and support it, but also botanic gardens in the other regions of the world maybe can partner and support those um, institutions and conduct research and work in those biodiversity hotspots. So, Towards that end, the Global Tree Conservation Program was created in 2014 at the Morton Arboretum with a pretty straightforward mission of trying to safeguard the trees, um, threatened trees, and of course, doing this through global collaborations. There's like a lot of threatened trees, and there's no way anybody can do that on their own. And the most recent exciting news is that we just signed an agreement with the IUCN um, Species Survival Commission to become the first center for species survival for trees. And the reason that we did this is to try to bring tree conservation to the table of the global conversation of um, conservation in the conservation world. So here are the existing centers of, um, for species survival around the world. And as you can see, they're all um, either zoos or aquaria. And we are the first one that's actually hosted at, um, at a garden or a burrito. The Albuquerque Biopark also has a part on pollinators and on succulents. And also we did this through a grant from uh, a local Chicago foundation called the Walder Foundation. And so we submitted two parallel grants with Shed Aquarium and us so that we're now the only city that has two parallel centers in the same city, which is the Center for Species Survival Freshwater, which is also uh, systems that are very threatened and losing biodiversity at alarming rates, and the Center for Species Survival for Trees, which we are hosting. And uh, the idea is to uh, promote Chicago as a hub for biodiversity conservation. So traditionally in our department or in our program, we have had uh, two foci. We have been focusing mainly in region, in regionally in the, with the trees of the United States and threatened trees of the United States, because we're in the United States, but also um, on oaks and therefore oak biodiversity hotspots. So here you can see a map of by country where we have the majority of threatened species of oaks, and this is directly correlated to where there are more oaks, right? Like the countries that are more biodiverse, they also have the more threatened species. And you can see China stands out, Southeast Asia, well, um, it's, we did Southeast Asia as a group here, some of the countries, and then um, Mexico with 32 threatened species. And so that has informed, we are a very tiny team compared to here. So we can't, you know, we had to decide, okay, where are we going to have the most impact? Where should we be working? We can not just randomly go work everywhere. And so this is so far where we have targeted at Earth. And our approach has been a modification of the Access Plan Act developed by the IUCN, which has been used for conservation for many years for animals and other taxa. And um, underlying those Access Plan Act activities, we also focus a lot on building capacity and networks for coordinated action. So now I'm going to just tell you a little bit about one or two projects that we do in each of those uh, as an illustration. So the first step when you want to um, safeguard a species, when you need to know who and you need to know and make some decisions on which are the species that need the most action. So that is what we call the prioritization process. And we use, uh, we have been working a lot with um, the red list of the IUCN through the global tree assessment that ended in the report that I was um, talking about in the introduction. And we have been doing these reports and I brought some that you can pass around and you can actually keep them if you want. So we did like the Oaks 2020, which is like all the Oaks of the world. And this is a um, red list for the US Oaks. And so these also are obviously PDF and this is like a summary, but each of those are real red list assessments that you can Google and the species will come into the 
read this with uh, the category that reds and all that. And then um, we, last year, um, in an effort led by um, my supervisor, Murphy Westwood, uh, published the checklist of US trees with also assessments, um, which is like, I think one of the first checklists for just trees of the United States. And so that's a great starting point for prioritizing. Prioritizing. Priori prioritizing the trees that are threatened and um, within the continental United States. And also, um, we do these uh, conservation gap analysis, uh, which is a little bit more looking into like collections and what is found in collections. And uh, we develop this methodology in conjunction with BGCI staff, um, BGCI US in particular, and we have done it for like nine genera and of trees of the United States. Um, here's like the example of the oaks. And right now we are working on that conservation gap analysis for Mesoamerican oaks. And let me tell you, that's a whole different ball game because there's a lot of data for the United States. It's pretty well known. There's all these exceed collection data. And when you move outside of the United States, that's not so. So here are just like a summary um, of some of the steps that what is a gap analysis, right? So you first go and identify your target taxa. In this case, we have 65 oaks, um, 34 are threatened, and 31 data deficient. Right there, not very helpful. And then um, you distribute ex situ surveys to gardens to find out who has collections for those species. And um, then you gather all these ex situ data and also in situ occurrence data, right, that you pull up from databases like Tropicals and all the other databases, GBIT, but then of course the points are not right and there's a lot of disagreement. So um, this is a project led um, by my coworker, uh, Kate Good, and here she was in Puebla last year with Susana Valencia and Alan Combs, like printing, she printed every single map and they're talking about every single point and trying to decide, you know, what are good points for each map so that you can see like what are the real occurrence of those species. And once you have your clean data and your clean maps, you can then do a threat matrix, a vulnerability matrix, and then you um, can send also a questionnaire again to your partners in botanic gardens to try to figure out what do they think are like the conservation actions that are needed for those particular species. And then you write a report like the one that I'm passing around that, you know, that can serve. And I, there's one for magnolias right now. And um, I think you were all, or some of you were involved in the crop wild relative one plus that has just been published. So some sneak peek on the results for these. Um, here are some of the most common quercus um, uh, species and their collection numbers. And you can see these are by region. So United States is blue, but these are Mesoamerican oak. So orange is Mesoamerica. So for example, if you're a Mexican oak, are you in any Mexican collections? And you can see there's not a lot of orange and that's the more common ones. And then these are like the second part of the species where there's um, some of them where there's zero collections anywhere in the world. Like those oaks are not even found anywhere. And a bunch of them are not even found in any collections in um, their native regions, let's say. So there's clearly a need for more collecting and more bringing these species into um, ex situ collections. Then you have the maps. And what you do is that you have um, these, um, it's like a little bit complicated, but I'm going to walk through it. So these are ecological regions. Those are the colors. And then you have points where you have um, wild provenance of source ex situ collection. So that means that somebody went, collected samples, and brought them into a botanic garden. And then the white points, the triangles, are the ones where there is occurrence data for that. For that. Then we just did a very random 50 kilometer circle around that. that uh, around that, that point, and we're assuming, okay, if you collected at least one sample from that point, 50 kilometers around that you covered all the genetic diversity. Now I know Christy is probably having a heart attack. That is like obviously not the case, but that is like an overestimation, you know, like, okay, at least we have one. And so in this case, for example, you can see that only, there's only collections representing these northern 
um, populations, but there is nothing that has been collected from all these regions. However, they seem to be kind of connected, so you can kind of assume that there is some gene flow. So those are some of the things that we can like, and obviously it's a rough estimate, you can go in a lot more depth, but this is a starting point to inform uh, where to collect. And um, the second step, and this is what Israel is working on, um, is that we want to do ecological niche model um, or spaces distribution modeling so that um, we can then use a multi-criteria analysis um, where we are going to look at species richness, geographic rareness, and irreplaceability to determine what are the most important areas in Mexico that we should be conserving if we want to conserve oak diversity. So when you overlay all these different species together, then there's going to be kind of like hotspots. Oh, wow, look, all these species are in this area, this region, this type of ecosystem. We should be putting more efforts into preserving that, that part. So that's some of the assessments. So now you know what are your priority species in theory, you know which ones are the ones, and maybe you know where you should be working. And so the next um, step is to plan for action. And this is, again, we are working with the methodology from the IUCN Conservation Planning Specialist Group that has been using for creating action plans for elephants and pandas and all those pretty animals. And we're trying to adapt it for trees. So for example, we created a national plan for the oaks of the Californias. There are these rare oaks in California that occur in the Channel Islands. They're rare. Some of them go into Mexico. There's seven species. And so Amy Byrne, this is uh, she's um, our coordinator for the Global Conservation Consortium for Oak that we lead and you know, about in a second. Um, but she led this effort. And so um, we created, got everybody together. The cool thing about this is that it's done through a participatory decision-making process. So you bring all the stakeholders into a room, ideally in person, and you do all these uh, conversations and this assessment, okay, what do you experts, and farmers and stakeholders and government officials think are the things where we can intervene? Where can we you know, do something to preserve the species? And let's come up with a very clear plan with names and timelines and budget of what we're gonna do. So this is what we're doing. Um, for the action plans for some of the oaks, and they really have been a great tool. I was a little skeptical from the beginning, but I have to say, at least in the United States so far, it's been very good. We are using these to um, improve targeted collections for those uh, priority species, um, uh, to increase representation in ex situ collections and in near situ sites. We are also developing petitions with um, to include some of these species in the Endangered Species Act such as this work with Central Census. And this year, for example, we're hosting a workshop in Baja California, in Mexico, where we are trying to bring together the Mexican people where this oak occurs, well, these several of the species, with the Southern United States, you know, mostly like California experts who try to um, talk about, okay, what are some of these common risks? What can we do together? Maybe the U.S. can bring some expertise, but maybe the Mexicans also know where some of these species is found, that there's no collections and things like that. And so um, we're also partnering with land managers. So we just signed an MOU with the Wildlands Conservancy, who are the biggest um, land trust in California. And they have a lot of land all over um, California and other states that they are using for um, preserves and for recreation. And so they have a ton of land and botanic gardens have the expertise, such as the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, San Diego Botanic Garden. So San Diego and um, San Diego Zoo and also San Diego Botanic Garden are doing the collections, growing the seedlings, and then we're going to work with people from the Wildlands Conservancy to plant uh, out these seedlings of rare oaks and restore in some of their into their lands. So it is a good partnership that I think has been informed by the by the action. And then the most important, the action. So it was assessed by an app. So these are like some of the, I am originally from Costa Rica and Costa Rica, as some of you may know, is like a country that has, I would say pretty, has been pretty on the, you know, on the lead of conservation globally. But I also grew up seeing all these like 
people like coming and trying to tell Costa Rican people what to do and like then they would leave and things then are all like confusing because then <laughs> people don't know like what are the right decisions. Anyway, it's complicated. So I have very strong feelings about how to do in situ conservation projects. And uh, we really try to always do science-based integrated conservation that support sustainable livelihoods, respect local culture and traditional knowledge. And we always work with in-country partners. Like I'm never gonna go from Morton into somewhere like, you know, in another part of the world and tell them, oh, I think you should do this or that, right? Like you need to work with the local stakeholders who are the users for the species and try to find common solutions that also work for the local people. So this is just an example of um, one of the projects that we have, and this is the Arbojo oak or Quercus brandegay or Brandivia. And it is a species that is only found in Baja California Sur in Los Cabos region. And this is like the Baja California Peninsula is only here in Los Cabos, like where people go on spring break. And people, it's crazy. Like you fly into the Los Cabos airport and there's like a margarita bar right, right there. <laughs> Everybody just goes to their hotels and they don't know that literally 45 minutes from there is one of the coolest uh, biosphere reserves, which is the Sierra La Laguna Biosphere Reserve. And this is um, what, I don't know if you guys have heard the term Sky Island, but because of the geology and how this um, natural history of the tip of the Baja Peninsula these species pretty much had nowhere to go and so it's like 30 percent endemism uh it is amazing the flora is like super interesting and um this is where this arroyo oak is found which is actually closely related to corpus virginiana the live oak is part of the live oaks and so um it's called the arroyo oak because it only occurs right next to these ephemeral riverbeds um and that's the pretty much the only place you can find it until like Maybe highest is like 250 meter elevation. So, <clears throat> Karine at um, um, uh, Calendar Paris had been doing work there, and she was the one that said, I think you guys should really do research with, species, with these species. There's no regeneration, there's zero seedlings. And so, we did, we went, we tried to do some um, surveys, and there's no seedlings. We've never seen a seedling in the wild ever. There's these adult trees. This is the tree right here, it's beautiful. And it's just like a libo. And um, so we were trying to figure out, okay, so we did the science, what is going on? We uh, worked with a Mexican student with the Centro de Investigaciones Biológicas, which is like a federal research institute there. And he did his master's looking at um, acorn production. They produce acorns, perfectly fine, super high germination rates. We planted them in the greenhouse. They seem to be happy as they can be. So then we are trying to figure out well, what's going on. And so this is a biosphere reserve. So you would say protected. This is this whole thing, the whole, this is pretty much the Sierra La Laguna, the green. So the distribution of the species is protected. So this is a very interesting case where just protecting the land is not enough. This species is in protected land, but there are people and some ranchers that have um, ranches right next to the arroyos because this is where the water are, where the water is. And so um, they have pigs and they have cows and they have goats that are roaming free in the, in the landscape. And so we set up an exclosure experiment where we planted seedlings in protected and unprotected exclosures. And then we track survival rates. And you can imagine like, oh, this messed up. This is the unprotected, this is the protected and the unprotected. And you can see the unprotected had way more grazing than the protected. Now you can say, how did the protected had grazing? This is because the cow broke the fence and actually went over and ate the seedlings. But the pigs went under and tried to dig the seedlings. <laughs> so there's a very clear, you know, effect of the grazing and of the farm animals. And then um, now what do we do? We cannot tell the people to sell their pigs. We cannot tell the people to sell their cows. This is a very important part of their life. So what we did, is that we set up this adopt a tree program called Salvemos al Encino Arroyero. And Daniel is our project manager there. He is amazing. And he has been working with the local communities. We have community nurseries, and we are uh, working with the ranchers too, uh, so that they are the stewards of the species 
and they adopt the trees and they have like their little like gardens where they have mango trees and other crops, you know, because they also don't want their cows and pigs to eat their food. So then they're planting them on the sides or on the fences. And um, at the same time, we are really working and doing some outreach work. So we promoted the first uh, Festival Comunitario del Encino Arroyero last year, which was great. They organized it all themselves. And um, we even had like a competition of atole that's made with the flower of the acorns. And so um, there was like a cooking contest with the local ladies doing like the atole and a drawing contest and tree planting. And we also made a movie, like a mini documentary about this project in Spanish. And we tried to, um, you know, disseminate the story, but not only in English, but in Spanish, so that the local stakeholders also, you know, know their story about, about their trip. So I think that that is a, like a good example of like a project that um, has gone all the way from assessment to action that has been pretty successful so far. And, um, and then, of course, the bad thing is like it's just one species, and it has taken so much work. I've been working, I've been leading that project since 2017, so it takes a long time. Um, but that's it. And then uh, we also do some capacity building um, because, as I was saying, there are so many species. There's no way we're going to be able to work with them all, but maybe we can have bigger ant impact if we multiply those of us that are working with threatened trees and threatened plants. So we created the species steward training program as part of this. Um, I was telling you that um, Botanic Garden Conservation International um, started this GCC, which is a global conservation consortia for some um, particular uh, taxonomic groups that are exceptional. So you cannot seed bank them. They usually are pretty charismatic. There's like one for cycads and magnolias and erica and rhododendron and um, what's the time one? Evolution? Connie first, I think it's in the, and the big hero cards so far. And hopefully you guys are gonna start your own. And so uh, we, lead the, we lead the one on the, on the oaks. And so as part of this, one of the designations is that you can be a species steward. So with Becky here at Missouri Botanic Garden, you guys are the species steward for Quercus arcansana, for example. And so you have some uh, seedlings and you're helping conserve it. And so the idea is to bring all these people together in different botanic gardens, you know, to help um, with conservation of different oaks. And um, so the steward program, we are um, doing trainings virtual and in person uh, with botanic gardens in Mexico and Central America so that they can start their own conservation projects with some of these threatened oaks. And so Bella has been uh, very involved in this. And um, we have created some materials like this one, which I also brought up for you, which is a propagation manual for oaks by in Spanish, so that you know, like we can share it and bring it, and people um, can learn how to propagate their oaks. And um, now we are expanding a little bit to Southeast Asia. We're hosting a couple of workshops this year. We're starting slowly because it's a lot, and we're a small team. But yeah, we um, I think it's 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 going to be very exciting um, trying to to start work in that part of the world. Um, and the building networks, right? We need that consortium, as I was saying, um, which has been, I think, pretty successful. We are also, as part of this, doing uh, the Meta Collection Partnership Program, which is trying to have collections of these trees. Trees take a lot of space, and gardens cannot plant like many of these um, uh, trees. So the idea is that the meta collection is a collection of collections. So for example, here, um, maybe at Missouri Botanic Garden, you can have a couple of trees and then other gardens in Atlanta can have a couple more. And then together between all the gardens, then we have a good representation ex situ of the diversity of, um, of a particular species. And um, so we are also, we lead the ArbNet, which is a network of Arboleta, a global network of Arboleta. And so we're working with ArbNet partners so that they also, you know, start uh, planting some of these, of these oaks in, in, their, in their collections. <coughs> so it truly is, even though we have a very small staff and core team, we really do work with partners all over the world and do a lot of collaborative um, work. And we are very grateful um, to our partners, because there's no way we would be able to do any of that without them. 
So to finalize, um, this is a, uh, like a framework that um, Botanic Garden uh, Conservation International, or BGCI, had developed for some of the ways that um, Botanic Gardens can contribute to conservation and preventing loss of biodiversity. And I think it illustrates pretty well like all the things we can be doing. And for sure, one garden, unless you're like one of the super big gardens, uh, cannot do all of these. But even if you do any of those, it's already good. You know, like even if you focus on one thing in your area, um, I think that you are contributing to the bigger picture of land conservation. And some of the things that I think should be added <laughs> are more like supporting sustainable livelihoods and traditional knowledge, because if people have no means of making a living, their conservation is not going to work. And also policy, at least um, at the Arboretum, we have not really been involved in policy a lot. And I think we could be bolder and, you know, we need to move forward a little bit faster, being involved in local politics, regional politics, and global politics to support uh, or promote plant conservation um, so that we can promote social change that's going to result in uh, prevention of uh, loss of species. And thank you. With that, I would be happy to take questions. <laughs>